wonderful family. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, friends, uh, don't worry. I know uh, it's, it's, it's about 1140 or so, but we're going to get into God's word, and I think today's message is a little shorter than usual, okay? So let's bow our heads for prayer, and uh, let's dive into God's word. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the opportunity you give us uh, to worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you for the way you're working in people's lives and Justin's lives and also in our lives, Lord. May our lives bear testimony to what you have done. May we recognize that just as you called the disciples of old, you're calling us today. Many of us have responded to that call, that initial step to follow you, but there's a next level, Lord. There's, 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 now is the time for us to level up, to choose you and to serve you in ministry in some shape or capacity. Father, as I share your word, I pray that your spirit be with me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, friends, I want to invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 10. We're turning our Bibles to the book of Matthew. What chapter did I say? Yeah. Verse 10, amen. And so, uh, you know, we want to uh, begin by reading this passage, right? This passage, again, is found in the book of Mark, uh, chapter 10. So, again, if you got your Bibles, if you have your uh, a Bible app, you know, your smart device, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew, chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. Are you there? Amen? Amen. All right, I'm reading from the ESV. The Bible says, and he called to him his 12 disciples, and he gave them what? He gave them what? power, right? My translation says authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Now, friends, if the Bible text stopped right there, I'd be fine. But then it lists the people to whom God gave power. Are you with me, church? When we look in verse 2, the names of the 12 disciples, right? The word apostles means sent or the sent ones, right? And who are these Disciples that God calls and then he sends. The first one is Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Now, friends, when you read this at first glance, I'm a little confused because these folk were very sanctified to me. Amen. Remember Peter? Peter was always running his mouth, right? Peter was always running his mouth. He was always packing the sword, and he was ready for some action, wasn't he? James and John, they were also called by Jesus. And so these three guys, they probably would have some street cred, right, if, if they were living today. Because think about it. If you think about James and John, they didn't call them James and John. They had nicknames. What did they call them? The Sons of Thunder, right? They had nicknames, right? And, you know, they were, they were actually low-key arsonists. Why? Remember the story? As soon as they heard that these Samaritans refused to welcome Jesus, these two brothers were like, Lord, would you like us to call fire from where? From heaven and just burn down the entire village. Is, is that what you like us? Just say the word, Lord, we'll do it. Ready to burn up the place. And these were the brothers that Jesus gave power to? Are you with me? There's Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, the doubter, Matthew, the publican. And, and who were the publicans in Jesus' days, brothers and sisters? Tax collectors. Publicans were white-collar crooks. And so you know, brothers and sisters, sometimes we have these high and lofty idea that we become church leaders and pastors. But, but let me tell you, folks, you're not a leader in God's remnant church for the reasons that you think. You see, God has a totally different objective in mind when he called you from darkness into his light than you had in mind. And the reason why I know is because there's no way in the world that you could understand your need for Jesus as much as Jesus understands your need for him. Are you with me? The truth is, folks, that some of us need to get off the high horse. Take a, sit down, take a seat down here and humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. We need to let go of these crazy ideas about ourselves. You see, some church leaders think that they were brought into the church because they have so many gifts to contribute. 
Some think they were brought into the church because they can teach or preach the word of God. Others think, well, I'm a great administrator at my job. Surely the church can use me. And some teachers are like, some teachers are like, God called me because the church members need me to lead them. But I got news for you, brothers and sisters. When I read the list of the people that Jesus called, are you with me? When I read the list, I know that God had something else in mind because I'm reading about crooks, insurrectionists, impulsive, big mouth brothers, and he gives them power. Can you believe that? God gives these group of men power. And the Old Testament is no different, brothers and sisters. God chose people like the sons and daughters of Jacob. Have you read about them? Remember Abraham, the father of the faithful? He lied multiple times. His son Isaac did the same. Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes, had significant character flaws. For sake of time here, but I just want you to know if you're taking notes, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 8, God explains why he chose Israel. And he chose Israel like he chose us today, not for their righteousness, but because he loved them and God keeps his promises. Amen? God didn't choose them because they were perfect. God didn't choose the church leaders here in Highland Hills because they're perfect. No. Like Israel of old, we too are hard-headed failures and flawed. So let's make it plain today, church leaders. God chose the sons of Jacob because they were the hardest to save. And so when you and I accept a call to serve in a leadership role, it's a declaration that you have problems. My brothers and sisters, we need to be humbled by the Holy Spirit. No one is so essential that the church can't survive without us. Lord forbid if an elder or a pastor was to die and rest in Jesus next month, guess what? We'd be replaced. Isn't that right? If something happened to me, now take care of my family now, amen? Y'all promise to take care of the family? Something happens to Pastor Mark? That was kind of weak. Y'all promise to take care of my family? Amen, amen. Take care of my wife and my babies right there, you know. But friends, the truth is that if something happened to me next week, car accident, whatever, I pray I die in Jesus, amen? And I'll see you at resurrection morning. But if something happened to me, church, the truth is y'all be contacting Elder Reynolds. Elder Reynolds, we need a new pastor. That's right. So let's not ever think that the church can't function without us. This is God's church, and God will provide a way to keep it moving. Amen? So let's come to terms with this reality. God's calling isn't about our greatness, but his grace and power working through our weaknesses. Amen? You see, I believe that we should share the following with every new leader. Listen up. Don't think that you're called to serve in church leadership, to serve in church leadership because of your eloquence or knowledge of the Bible or your leadership skills. Church family, we've been called to serve in church leadership because God wanted to save us from hellfire. The fact is, folks, we're in ministry because we're the hardest to save. Just ask your spouse or family, and they'll tell you the truth. They'll tell you that, you're difficult to live with. So humble yourself and seek Jesus daily, amen? Because a church leader can't give what he doesn't possess. But as you connect with Jesus Christ, guess what? Jesus will shine through you. My point is, brothers and sisters, for my elders, the fact that you are a leader, an elder, you should be humble, not proud, thankful, not arrogant. Are you with me? You should be a team player, not difficult to deal with. Be grateful that God loved you enough to call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen? What moves me so deeply, brothers and sisters, is realizing that Jesus called those 12 disciples, even though he knew each and every one of those disciples inside and out. Are you with me? Did Jesus know everything that was in these disciples? Absolutely. Think about it. Jesus knew every flaw, every weakness, every hidden sin, 
And Jesus wasn't discouraged by what he saw. Brothers and sisters, you and I, we ought to praise God that he called us to serve in ministry and leadership. It's an honor to serve in God's house. Amen? It's, uh, it's an honor to be a leader in God's house. You know, I think about how God looked at my rebellious self. Yes, me. I think about when God called me, right? I'm sure that God saw a little Peter in me. I'm sure he saw some publican in me. I'm sure that God saw the defensive and selfish nature in me, and yet Jesus still said, I want this guy in my kingdom. You see, brothers and sisters, God loves trophies, amen? And I am a trophy of God's saving grace. Yes, sir. God looked at Mark Anthony and said, yeah, I know he's hard-headed. Yes, I know he's rebellious. Yes, I still want him. You know, I went through a period in my life, brothers and sisters, when I was in trouble all the time. I was making poor decisions. Yes, I grew up in the church, but I was living so far away from my Heavenly Father. Yet, praise God for his infinite mercy. Just like God sees in all of you today, he saw potential in our brokenness. He saw a future church leader despite my failures. He saw someone worth redeeming despite my flaws. And yes, he called me, not because of my righteousness, but because of his righteousness, his love, and his grace. And he's calling you today as well. So friends, let's be grateful. Let's be thankful that God sees beyond our mess, and he calls us anyway. Amen? Let's remind ourselves that our calling is a testament to God's power to transform lives to turn the rebels into leaders and sinners into saints. Amen? Now let's talk about these disciples real quick. These disciples that Jesus called. They were given power over devils. Isn't that right? They were given power over devils, brothers and sisters, yet they ran when they saw a demon-possessed man. Have mercy. I mean, we're the sad, sorry group of brothers. And yet God keeps working. God kept believing. God keeps loving. He keeps showing. He keeps teaching. He keeps praying. He keeps being patient. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Do you see it? That's why you're a church leader. It's not because of your bachelors or your masters, but it's because of the master. Jesus will not give up on you. He won't do it. He loves you too much, my brother. He loves you too much, my sister. Yes, God knows you're stubborn. He knows you're hard-headed. He knows you're self-centered. And God says, they will not discourage me out of saving them. I will save them. So let me show you something, church. Before the cross, before the resurrection, before Peter denies him, it's before Judas betrays him. It's before they all forsake him and abandon him. It's right after they finish the Last Supper. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John chapter 13, verse 36. John chapter 13, verse 36. Turn it in our Bibles to the book of John, chapter 13, verse 36. Are we there? So the Bible says, Simon Peter said to him, there goes that big mouth brother, right? He says, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. And so once again, we see here in John Verse 37 and 38, Peter says to him, Lord, why can, I, why can I not follow you? I will lay down my life for you. Verse 38, Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me. Not once, not twice, but how many? Three, Three times. So you guys got the scene now. You got the picture in your mind. They just finished supper. Peter's mouth is running. Jesus knows that Peter's still proud. Jesus knows that Peter's not humble. Peter knows 
disciples, or I should say Jesus knows, and yet he calls them out in front of the rest of the disciples. And Jesus says, excuse, excuse me, brother, I appreciate what you just said, but the fact is that the rooster is going to crow in the morning, and you will deny me three times. But yet, in the Bible, as some of you know, there are no chapter divisions, right? There are no chapter what? There's no chapter divisions in the Bible. And so John chapter 13, verse 38, is followed immediately by what? John 14, verse 1. And in the Greek, again, there's no chapters, right? There's no commas, etc. So you know that John 14, verse 1, Jesus is given his immediate response to Peter. Are you listening, brothers and sisters? Do you see it, church leaders? Jesus turns to Peter. After telling him, you're going to deny me, he tells him what? Are we there? The Bible says, let not your heart be what? Troubled. Come on now. He turns to Peter and says, I just told you that you're going to deny me, but don't be upset, Peter. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, Peter, are many mansions, and I go and prepare a place for you. Are you listening, church? Jesus is like, look, I'm so confident, my child. I'm so confident, Peter, that you're going to make it, Peter. I know how the story is going to end, Peter. And even though I know you're going to deny me in the morning, I'm going to go ahead and start planning your mansion in heaven. Praise God. Y'all ain't with me. He tells the denier, I'm working on your address in heaven right now. Before you deny me, before you leave me, I still believe you're going to make it, Peter. Somebody out there ought to say amen. amen. Church family, do not stop praying for that ultra-conservative church member. Do not stop praying for that flaming liberal in the church. Do not stop praying for the person who's struggling. Do not stop praying for the person in our church that doesn't stop complaining. Keep praying for the church leaders. Keep praying for the pastor. Why? Because, yes, you might be stressing over them, but keep praying for them because God is preparing a mansion for them in heaven. It's there if they want it. The fact is that if God can save you, he can surely save them. And guess what? You might be living next to them in heaven. Amen. And if you're going to live next to them in heaven, if you're going to be there, you better figure out a way how to get along with them here on earth. Amen? You might be neighbors for all eternity. <laughs> you better start working those differences now. Amen? You see, God believes that by his grace and power, like Peter, y'all will overcome. Lord, help us. Amen. Many of us are like these New Testament disciples. We're all pathetic, right? You wonder what in the world is God going to do with this group of leaders? He's going to save us, brothers and sisters, by his grace. But we have to stay focused on the purpose as a believer, as a teacher, as a preacher. We must be humble. Right? God's purpose is to change us, to convert us, that you and I can become more and more like Jesus. God wants to change you as he's saving you. Isn't that wonderful? He wants to change me too. Why? Because Pastor Mark is full of self. You know, I struggle with some old habits, and y'all ought to pray for Pastor. Amen? Sometimes I get frustrated with myself and others, but Lord, save me from me. You know, I haven't lived in Chicago for almost 15 years, but some of Chicago wants to pop out sometimes, right? May the Lord save you from you. And may he save me from me. So let me ask you, how successful was Jesus? Was Jesus successful, brothers and sisters? Absolutely. The names of the 12 sons of Jacob, except for one, Dan, coincide with the 12 gates to the city. How successful was Jesus? The name of the 12 disciples are on the foundations of the holy city, except for one, Judas. Church family, I think you and I can trust our salvation to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. My friends, at this time, I want to make a short appeal. 
Matthew 4.19 says, follow me. What does he say? Follow me. In other words, God is reminding us, don't follow the pastor. Don't follow the church leader. Follow who? Follow Jesus. We come to this church not because of the pastor or the preacher. We come to this church to worship Jesus. Amen? You might disagree with the pastor or an elder, but you don't come, stop coming to worship Jesus because you disagree with the pastor or a church leader. You come to church to worship Jesus. Amen? That's the success. That's the tip to success in the life of a Christian. We follow Jesus, not man. Follow Jesus, brothers and sisters. Not the elder, not the pastor. Follow Jesus. Why? Because man may fail you, but God never will. We come to worship him. Man sees what's on the outside, but God sees what's on the inside. Amen? Now, aren't you thankful that he was never discouraged by the you and you when he called you? Amen? Answer the call to follow Jesus. Become his disciple, brothers and sisters. If you're thankful with me this morning that God is willing to change you and to save you, I want to invite you to please stand. If you want to thank Jesus right now for calling you, I want to invite you to please stand. Now, please listen carefully, church. This is not a general appeal. The first one was general. This one is specific. If your relationship with Jesus Christ could be better, if you've resisted God working on you and there's still some things that he needs to accomplish in you and through you, then this appeal is for you. And I'm not concerned of whether you're, you know, a church member, or you're a church leader, or you're visiting for the first time. If, if you're like, Lord, I recognize I need some special work. If you have the courage to say, Lord, I need some special work done in my life. If that is your need, I want you to come to the front with me. I'm going to join you halfway. I want you to come down with me so I can have a special prayer with you this morning. Mel, if you can play something in the background, please. Brothers and sisters, it's time for us to follow Jesus with all of our hearts. The fact that we are here today is because of God's grace, amen? amen. None of us are good. Only God is good, amen? amen? And he's called each and every one of you to follow him. He's called you to serve him, not partially, but wholeheartedly. We witness here in our church how a young lady Share with another young lady about Jesus. And if God can use a child to bring her father to Jesus, I can assure you God can reach each and every one of you to reach someone for Jesus. Because it's not about our eloquence, it's about our willingness to be used by God. You might be like Moses, Lord, I, I can't speak, I don't know what to say. God will give you the words. So friends, I praise God for each and every one of you. I truly am. But we have too many empty seats some of people who haven't come or don't come regularly, and some of people who have not heard the gospel. But how can they accept the gospel if they haven't heard the gospel? But this is where God says, follow me. Be my disciple. Follow what I've outlined in scripture and the heart and passion I had for the people when I walked the earth. As I live my life in you, I want to do this through you so that others may get to know your Savior. I praise God for you guys coming here because this appeal was not for everybody. It was just for those that recognize, Lord, you've been calling me and I've just been serving you half-heartedly. 
But today, and there's still time for some of you still standing and haven't come to the front, I invite you, God invites you. It's not about me, it's about God. And God is taking record. His angels are recording those who truly want to follow Jesus all the way. So as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, we pray. Father in heaven, we need you. The Bible says we do not receive because we do not ask. Today we ask for the Holy Spirit, Lord, to be poured out in full measure. Lord, we recognize we're messed up. We have struggles. There's things still pulling us to this world. But in Christ Jesus, we have the victory. And so we praise you, Lord, that you've called us to be your disciples. Help us, Lord, to serve you and make disciples of others as the gospel commission commands of us. And, Lord, help us where we're weak, where we struggle. And, Lord, I pray for our young people, our older people, that we can be a church who's united and that people may know that the Holy Spirit reigns here, Lord, that the love of God is in our hearts towards one another. Because, Lord, if we want to make it to heaven, if we want to make it to heaven, we better get along here, Lord can't get along here some of us ain't gonna make it there so lord give us the grace the patience the love to pray for one another and the fact is if god can save us he can save our neighbor so lord work in us in a mighty way lord I also take this time to lift up our elders of the church that your holy spirit may fill them satan is trying to mess with me and the elders lord as leaders of your church for he knows if he can get us to fall it weakens the faith of others who have their eyes on us. But Lord, today I ask them, keep your eyes on Jesus, but help us as leaders to do the same. Keep our eyes on you and be an example to those that we shepherd. Bless your people, Lord. Bless our children. I pray for the families, Lord, the marriages in our church. Some may be struggling, Lord. I pray for the children. Sometimes parent-child relationships aren't where you want it to be, Lord, and so we ask for your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom to seek the Bible, seek your word, seek professional counseling if necessary, Christian counselor, Lord, and may your Holy Spirit and your will be done in our lives. Father, we pray all these things, not because we good or deserve, but because you say to us, and so